first of all, reminding uh, some of the parents that are in here next weekend is our youth uh, retreat, July the 16th to the 18th. And I'm pretty sure, and you know, trying to keep you informed, I'm pretty sure next Wednesday night, next Wednesday, we'll be having a uh, meeting uh, after church next Wednesday before we go uh, on that trip on Thursday. So if you're, you're a parent here, uh, please try and be here next Wednesday night. We'll be having a meeting for the youth before we take them off um, on that Thursday. So be praying that everything goes well uh, for us to get this opportunity to be able to go there. Um, I also want to mention tonight uh, that our nursery right now is closed. It will be closed. Um, uh, it probably will be closed Sunday as well. We're in the middle of uh, remodeling and renovating our nursery. We're going to be turning it into Noah's Ark on the inside. And so that's what you kind of see some of the, the paintings and the, the lions and tigers and bears that are in the hallway out there tonight. That's a, a part of our remodeling on the nursery. So we're really excited about that to do that while, while we're kind of in a, in, a, in a place where we're not using that as we were, what we, what we were allowing parents to go in there and sit and, and take their children. But right now everything has been moved out of there uh, for, the, for the repainting and all that good stuff that's going on, hopefully. By the following Sunday, we'll be back open in there as well. Uh, I do want to mention this also. If you have evening offering, I know I have folks that on Sunday nights give me offering, and, and Wednesday nights, what you do, I want to be mentioning this, if any time you have offering on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights, you bring it up and put it in our, our offering place, and we will always, we're always faithful to check that at the end of the service. You can do it at the beginning of the service, or you can do it at the close of our service, but you can bring your offering. Uh, right here to the front and just drop it in our plate uh, at the end. I just have people always asking me that. I want to make sure that that's clear. And then I will also welcome you, that those that are watching on Facebook, we thank you for joining us as well. But as we get started tonight, how about let's stand up all over the house, and we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. I'm glad to see you this evening. I hope you're glad to see me tonight yeah. Amen, as well as I am you. But we're just glad to have you with us tonight in the house of the Lord. Uh, and let's open up with a word of prayer. Brother Wayne, will you pray, pray for us, please? Pray. Heavenly Father, we love you so much, and we just thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to come see your house tonight, God. Uh, we pray right now that the Holy Spirit would just lead us in our worship and, and hearing, God, of the, the preached word, Lord, that it will change our lives. We thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. And everybody says, Amen. Amen. Lord, and clap for praise.
The first thing that I want to point out to you is this. The first reason that God does not reveal to us the details of our life in advance is that we wouldn't like it or we wouldn't want it. We'd say, no, God. Why doesn't God give us details and specifics in advance? Because we would not like it, we wouldn't want it, and we would flat out just say no. Case in point, does anybody remember a man by the name of John? Amen. Anybody remember a man by the name of John? Let, let's just read the opening verses of Scripture in John chapter 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise. God sends him specific directions. He gives him his specific will here. Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, cry out against it. He gets specific, for their wickedness has come up before me. But, somebody say, but. Uh, Jonah arose and he flees to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa. He found a ship going to Tarshish. He paid the fare and he went down into it to, to go with them to Tarshish. From, it says it twice in there, that he went from the presence of the Lord. Amen. Get this. God called. Jonah answered. Jonah did like what God had to say about his immediate future. He said, no thank you, God. I'm going to Tarshish. And he literally flees. He runs from the presence of God. It makes it very clear. It specifically says there in the three verses twice. That Jonah pleased from the presence of, of God. He did not want to hear what God had to say. I am convinced, church, as I stand upon this stage this evening, if the Lord was to share with you some of the plans that he had for your lives, if God was to share with you some of the specifics of the valleys that you might have to go through or the crosses that you might have to bear or the burdens that you might have to bear, do you know what we would say, Sister Elena? No thanks, Lord. No thanks, Lord. I, I don't think, I think I'll pass. You can give that to somebody else. But I think that I'll go this direction instead. Come on now. If we be sincere, and we understand that you know, Jonah knew that that city was wicked. He, God says it was a wicked city. They killed prophets. They didn't want to hear the word of the Lord. Kind of like how America is getting right now. People don't want to hear the truth of God's word. Nineveh was just like that. We're on the way there right now. That preacher didn't want to go down there. He said, God, no thank you. I don't want that. And he flees from the presence of, of the Lord. Friend, I believe many of us would do the same thing. If God began revealing things to us, things that we might have to go through, difficult things that we might have to, to bear for Him, some of us might say, no, no thanks, Lord. No thanks, Lord. Now, there are some things that the Lord does reveal to us, isn't there? There are some things that the Lord does reveal to us. He doesn't get, I don't believe God gets really specific. I'm giving an example of my own life. God reveals some things. On April the 1st, 2008, I know that 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 God called me to preach. God specifically called me to preach on April 1st, 2008. I, I know that God did. But God did not get specific about the things that would happen following that. He didn't get specific about the burdens that I would have to bear as a pastor or a preacher of the gospel. God did not get specific about all the places that I would have to walk alone and how long that I would have to walk alone on this journey. God did not get specific about the crosses and the sorrows that I would have to bear or the sleepless nights in prayer or worry that I might have to bear. God just simply said, hey, I'm calling you to pastor. I've got an anointing on your life. I called you to pastor. But God didn't give me all the specifics of things that I might have to go through in my future. He didn't speak about the sorrows and all of these other things. Because you want to know why? Because if he did, I might have to be like Jonah. No, Lord. No, Lord. Think about it. He didn't mention 
those things because we might be like Jonah. Let me remind you something that the Word of God tells us. Whatever the Lord calls us to, it's not always easy. Whatever the Lord calls us to, it's not always easy. And sometimes the will of God for your life is actually to endure some suffering and some trials and some hardship. Peter writes this verse, Peter 3, 17, says, For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Very simply, sometimes you can do good, you can do right, and you can be right in the center of God's will and obey the word of God, but there's still suffering and trials that come along with that. There's still suffering and trials that come. It don't matter you've been righteous. We talk about being righteous and walking in a straight line before God Sunday morning. And you can do that and still trials and sorrow will find you. Sometimes that's a part of God's will for your life. Paul called that sharing in Christ's suffering. But it's in those sufferings and those trials that we've come to know God's grace more than ever before. It's where we find His strength rising up in us. It's where we're conformed to Christ's image. It's where we are purified through the fire. Yes. Trials and suffering are often a part of God's will for our lives. But He doesn't always tell us the specifics of those things. He doesn't always tell us the certain burdens that we're going to have to bear. Because you want to know why? Because we might say, no, we would run from it. That's right. And you know what happens? When we run, try to outrun God, when I outrun the will of God, we end up in greater sorrow yeah. than if we'd have been obedient to start with. Yeah. Y'all remember old Jonah? Jonah said, what? No thanks? <coughs> yeah. Jonah got him a ticket, headed south, but God had a whale right there waiting on him. I think it would have been a lot easier if God if the gentleman would have said, all right, Lord, I'll do what you want me to do and went to Tarsus to start with instead of riding in the belly of the well for three days and three nights. Amen? Yeah. You can't outrun God's will for your life. Man, if God wants to be specific with us, a lot of times we just, we just wouldn't want it. Let me give you another example in the Scripture. God actually gets specific with the Apostle Peter. And I want you to look at his, his response to it. It's kind of interesting. In John chapter 21, this is where Jesus reinstates Peter. Remember, Jesus, Peter denied Christ three different times. And later on in John chapter 21, Jesus comes back after his resurrection. He speaks with Peter, and he says this, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? He asked him that three different times. And what he really was, he was reinstating the apostle Peter. And this is where we pick up towards the end of that. He said him to him the third time. Jonah, do you love me? Simon, Peter. Peter was grieved because he said this to him, to the, said this to him a third time. Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say, listen, he gets specific. I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. That wasn't one of those prosperity gospel prophecies over his life right there, was it? But he said, when you're old, people are going to lead you where you don't want to go. In other words, you're going to be in bondage. You're going to be carrying chains. Verse 19 says, this, this he spoke signifying what death he would glorify God. You know, sometimes people say, I just wonder when I'm going to die or how I'm going to die. No, you don't. You don't really want to know that because you would literally go crazy. But listen to this. And when he spoke and had spoken this, he said to him, speaking to Jesus, he said, all right, now follow me. Then Peter, look at the first thing that Peter does, turning around, he sees the disciple whom Jesus loved. That's John. John was referred to the disciple whom Jesus loved. He referred to himself in the book of John. Following, who had also leaned on his breast at supper, leaned upon Christ. And Peter said, Lord, who is the one, Lord, who, who said, John was the one that said this, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter seen John. He said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? What about him, Lord? Wait a minute. If I've got to go down that road, what about him? What about this disciple that was at the foot of the cross? What about this disciple? He, he was there and he leaned upon your, your chest while, 
while we were taking communion. What, what's going to happen to him, Lord? <coughs> Don't say that. We, we wasn't going to really hear it. Sometimes we get, we want God to God just be specific. Just show me this, 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 and just lay it all out for me. But in all, in all honesty, you couldn't handle it. In all honesty, you couldn't handle it. And you wouldn't want to hear it. Notice what he did. Jesus revealed these things, these details of the future, but Peter turns around and says, what about him? We can't handle it. The first reason that God does not reveal these details to us that sometimes we won't it's because we wouldn't want it. Number two, the second reason that God does not reveal to us these details of our lives is because we wouldn't understand it. What we could understand, a lot of it we wouldn't want. The other part of it, we wouldn't fully understand it. Let me prove this to you by drawing your attention to to the, what Jesus told the disciples about his death. Listen to what it says in Matthew chapter 16. It says this, Jesus said to him, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answers and he said, You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon or Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And also I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. From this time... Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, be killed, and be raised from the dead. So get this. Jesus is here. He's with his disciples. He asks them, who do you say that I am? Peter speaks up out of all of the twelve, and he says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And, and Jesus comes in and he says, flesh and blood has not revealed that to you, but, but my Father that is in heaven. He, he just always oh, you know, says, you got it, Peter. And then in the next passage, Jesus is like, okay, he, he's, he's getting this. He, he's getting this, who I am. He says, it's time for me to begin to share with them why I'm really here. What I really came to do. And so he begins this, he says he began, after this, he began to share with them that he was going to have to suffer, that he was going to have to die, and he was going to have to be resurrected. But listen what happens when Jesus began sharing God the Father's will with these disciples. Listen. Then Peter took him to the side, and he began to rebuke him. He said, far be it from you, Lord, this should happen to you. But he turned and he said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. You are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of, of men. One minute, Jesus is applauding my Peter, you've got it. And then he begins revealing to him God the Father's will for Christ. That he's got being specific about the detail. I've got to suffer. I've got to die, but I'm going to be resurrected. Guess what happened? They totally missed it. They totally did not understand what Jesus was saying. They, they did not grasp it. Let me put it in my own words. When it said that Peter rebuked him, he, Peter was saying, Jesus, you're wrong. That will never happen to you. That, that can't happen to you. That is just impossible. He missed it. He did not grasp it. They did not see how it was possible or how it made sense. And I believe that sometimes if God was to get specific with us about certain details in our life, I believe oftentimes we might be like Peter. That, that, that would never happen. We would miss it. Not that would happen to me. There, there's no way that I'd ever be able to do that. I, I'd never be able to go there. I'd never be able to fall in love with this person or get that job or do this or go through that. Sometimes the reason that God doesn't get real specific and he's just simply saying, trust me as you go 
if you're thinking like a man, you're not mindful of the things of God. We've got to remember that God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts, and God's thoughts are, His ways are higher than our ways. Yes. And if He was come down and just reveal you, just lay out certain things for you, you totally would not understand all of His purposes that He has for you. We would be lost, but we wouldn't grasp it. It would come over our heads. And I think we get so frustrated with God because sometimes He doesn't just lay these things out before us. I know that I have before. I'm like, God, you, you could be specific and just tell me what I need to do. Tell me this, tell me that. But you don't do that. We, we, we couldn't handle it. We wouldn't understand it. We would reject it. The third thing that I want to point out to you that I believe that the Lord showed me as I was thinking about this was this. Number three. One of the third reasons that God does not get specific about the details it's about our, about our lives is because we would run ahead of God. We would run ahead of God. In 1 Samuel, we read the story of King David. And when King David was being uh, anointed or he was being chosen by God, being anointed by Samuel the prophet to be the next king of, of Israel. The Bible says, matter of fact, that David's father, he looked at all of his brothers and he said, Surely these young strapping men, it's got to be one of these. And even Samuel thought the same thing. And God said, I don't look at them the way that you do. You look at the appearance of a man, I look at the heart of a man. Yes, and the Bible says that there was one son left that was not in the house and Samuel said, Jesse called him, and he come in, he was young David, he was just a young, rudy boy, the Bible says. And that is the young man that God chose to be the second king of Israel, and that day uh, Samuel anointed him to become king of Israel. But it took years and years for that man to become, to ascend to the throne of Israel. It took him years. As a matter of fact, he ran from King Saul for years and years before he ever got to the throne. And on one particular case, on one particular instance, when King David, or when, when, when David was running from Saul, he and his friends and his men were hiding in some caves. King Saul heard that they were in the area. He had come looking for them. King Saul had to stop and he had to go to the bathroom. And the Bible says he goes into the cave to use the bathroom. And David's men say to him, this is your chance. Listen to the words that it says in 1 Samuel chapter 24, I believe. Then the men of David said to him, this is the day which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand, that you may do to him as it seems good to you. And David arose secretly, cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Now it happened afterwards that David's heart was troubled, be, troubled him because he had cut Saul's robe. So what happens is, is, is David speaks over and he cuts a corner of it. His friends are saying, this is what the Lord meant. This is what the Lord meant. When, 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 when he said that he would give you those enemies into your hand, when you're going to become king, this is what the Lord means. You need to kill him. But notice what it says that the Bible says about David, that his heart was troubled. In other words, the Holy Spirit said, this ain't right. That's what happened. The Bible says he was filled. David was a man that was anointed the Holy Spirit from the day that Saul, that, that Samuel anointed him. The Holy Spirit said, no, that's not right. The Holy Spirit rose up and said to David, David, this is not your place. Now, a matter of fact, the Bible says that when Saul leaves the cave, that David cries out to him, and he says, Saul, I had the opportunity to kill you, but I didn't. He said, let the Lord judge between you and me. It's God's place. Amen. God established you. God's going to take care of this. What I'm saying and why I point that out, in the instance of this, David had received the word. He knew that he was going to be king. He also had received the word. That, uh, that God would put the enemies in his hand, all things like that. But notice this, 
that his friends were ready to pounce right then and there. They were ready to take matters into their own hands and kill Saul right there on the spot, the first chance that they have. But David restrained himself because the Holy Spirit was saying, no, no, that's all right. It's not time. What I'm saying is there's two groups of people there. Some of us would have run ahead of God, and others would be restrained. Well, let me put it this way. Let me use an example of how we might run ahead of God if we had a word from God. If God was specific about something. If God was specific about you getting a job, a particular uh, position at your job, Brother Lane, if God said you're going to have this job that's going to be yours, you know what we would have to be careful? That we were not tempted to lie and cheat and step on people to get into that position because we said, well, God said it's mine, I'm just going to take it. You see, you see what I'm saying? So we, if we weren't careful, we would run ahead of God. Let me use another example for you. If God was to tell me that I was to marry Sally Sue, do you know what I would do? I would be looking on Facebook for every Sally Sue that I could find and asking to see, see which one would date me. I'd be like, that's what the Lord meant right there. There she is. If God was to get specific about certain things, I mean, you would say we would run ahead of him if we weren't careful. You would see where I'm coming from. We would, we would pull a Sarah if we were not careful. That's what the Lord meant. That's what the Lord meant. If we, we, if we thought there's a difference in thinking that's what the Lord meant and that's what the Lord meant. Y'all understand what I'm saying? There's a difference in being, I, that, I think that's what the Lord meant, and that's what the Lord meant. Remember Sarah? They had received the word, you're going to have a son. God was specific. He said it will be Sarah and Abraham's son. But after waiting, remember what Sarah said, I know what God meant, that you're going to have a son. You're going to have a son, Abraham, with my maid servant. That's what God means. See, we got to be very careful because if we were to take those little details, we, we can just change it and make it fit anywhere we want to. And so that's why sometimes God doesn't give you the word that you think that you need. Because if so, you would run ahead of God instead of waiting upon Him and letting Him open the door up at the right time. You would be more like David's men that would run ahead instead of David who would be waiting on God to take care of it and being obedient to the Holy Spirit. That's why God can't. He has to be careful what he's telling you. Others. Others things that God might share with us, we just wouldn't get. Other things that we did get, guess what? It would just, we wouldn't want it. But we like specifics. We like details. We would love it if God just give us a little roadmap. That's what we want. Let me close with this. But this is what God wants. We want specifics and we like details. And we like to know kind of what's going to happen tomorrow. What's going to happen, you know, with my future. What's going to happen when I get married. What's going to happen? We want to know all these details. This is, that's what we want. This is what God wants. You to trust him with the details. God says to somebody tonight, let me take care of the details. Let me take care of the details. You've been working yourself up into a tizzy, and God simply says tonight, trust me with the details. You may be saying, there, Pastor, how can I trust God with the details? I'm going to give you two very simple points that go along with that tonight. How can I trust God with the details? You may be writing this down, number one. How can, why, how, why and how can I trust God with the details? Because God loves you, and God always has a good plan for your life. Amen. God loves you. Can I even get this? God loves you more than you love you. God loves you more than you love you. And God always has a good plan for your life. Always. When you're thinking about the details of how things in life are all come together and you're worried about this and worried about that, God says, I've got a plan. You will just trust me. 
We know the scripture where Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the thoughts I think towards you. Says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil to give you a future and a hope. Now, that does not mean, that verse does not mean that we are immune to sorrow, to sickness, and to pain. It does not mean that we will not go through sorrow. It does not mean that we won't experience sin. It does not mean that we will not experience pain and heartbreak. Not whatsoever. Do you know that when those words were spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, it was the beginning of the nation of Israel entering into 70 years of captivity. When the Lord spoke those words through Jeremiah, the nation of Israel was headed into captivity for 70 years. The people were saying, God has forgotten us. He has thrown us away. It is over. It's done with. There is no way forward from this. And then God burst onto the scene in verse 11. And God said, I know the thoughts that I have for you. <coughs> You think in one thing, you think that it's over. You think that I've forgotten you. You think that I don't have this thing under control. You think that I don't have a plan. But he said, I come by here to tell you, I got a plan. I know the thought that I think for you. And then he gets specific. He said, the good thoughts. Woo, his thoughts of peace and not of evil. I got a future and a hope for you. You can trust me with the details. Even in the midst of sorrow and pain, even headed into captivity, God said, I love you and I've got a good plan Amen. for your life. Oh, that's good news. I don't know about that's you, good. God. That's good news to me. God loves you and has a good plan for your life. Yes. I know the thoughts, he says, that I have towards you. The second thing just builds on that. The second part of that builds on that first one. God's will for your life was established in your mother's womb, and it has not changed. God's will for your life has, was established at conception, and it has not changed. Make sure you write the last part down in bold letters. And it has not changed. I believe that things in life might be delayed. We might take some detours in life. But the will of God will come to pass. Yes. God has a plan for your life. We just read that in Jeremiah chapter 29. You cannot fool the plans of God. Oh, ain't nobody said amen on that one. You didn't know what I That was right over your head. That was one of those y'all didn't understand. I said, you cannot fall. You cannot mess up. You cannot stop the plans of God. Somebody say amen. amen. Your sin cannot stop the plans of Almighty God. Your mess ups, your screw ups, your mistakes do not stop nor hinder the plans of God. Can somebody say amen in this house today? God's plans are not hindered by that today. Some of you just let it soak in a little bit. You can just all right, you get it when you leave here. Like, oh, okay. God's plans is not hindered by that. You might have to take the long way around. You might be in the wilderness and you might have to march around that desert 40 years, but God's plan is not going to stop. They could have went into the, the promised land 40 years earlier, but because of that sin, it delayed it, but it didn't stop the plans of God. Right. Do you understand that your sin, yes, it might delay it, it might hold it, but you go down some detours here and there because of mistakes, but it does not stop the plans of God. And some of you right now, you have been de just defeated because you think you've totally missed it. You have screwed up your plans for God. You ain't that good. You, you can't do that. You understand that? That's right. You can't mess up what God got planned. That's right. You can't mess up God's 
in control. God's will will be done. Catch this last part. 
and he shall direct your steps. Who's directing your steps? He is. Yes. He's leading you in his plan. He's leading you in his purposes. He's leading you where you need to be. Trust him with the details. What do you want? What God me is him that something you just said, Lord, I trust you. I trust you. I trust you, God. Let me share this with you in our club. Come on to the music. I want to share this with you just because God will give you a word of comfort, but it ain't always specific. Talking about receiving a word and direction and all these things. I talked about Sally Sue a minute ago. If God was specific with me say Sally Sue, I'd be looking for Sally Sue everywhere I went, wouldn't God didn't give me that word. But you know what somebody gave me a word of the other day? I, I, I'm very cautious when I receive words, but I, I received this one. Because God had already been working on my heart before I received it. He said, God said, continue to prepare my bride for I will prepare your bride. Yes, Lord. That's what the Lord has a word for me. God, you continue, the Lord said to me, you continue to prepare my bride. You're the bride of Christ, right? Yes, amen. And God said, I'm preparing your bride. God didn't get specific. Him will look for Sally Sue or <laughs> Billy Joe or Dean or whoever. God just gave me a word of comfort and said, I got it. Listen, he said, I've got it, and I'm working out the details. I'm working out the details of who. I'm working out the details of when. I'm working out the details of how. Do you understand that? Last few years, I've been kind of struggling with the who and the when and the how. But God said, just trust me for the detail. I've got it. Amen. Just trust me with it. I'm working out the who. I'm working out the when. I'm working out the how. And some of you have been stressing over these things, and God said, trust me with the details. Then you can go over the house too much. Hallelujah. As we close this evening, I'll give you time to respond to the word. If you know, I, I just I need, needed to hear that message and I need to trust you with the details. I've been trying to figure things out, and I feel the Lord just said, I have to trust you. To trust you. And I ask you this, I ask you to respond tonight. If you're struggling with that, I encourage you to put this word in your heart tonight to trust him. Let him do what God does and only can do. That's what we're saying tonight. That's what we're saying. Then though I'm running to your arms, I'm running to your arms, the riches of your love will always be enough, nothing compares to your
No one. 